this art has, this play has stained their psyches. It will never leave them, right? They're haunted by it. They're marked by it. They have the yellow sign or something, right? Like the mark of Cain. No? Cursed. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee with a little extra. <laughs> Cheers. <sighs> Quick house cleaning. Uh, I am reviewing uh, Sexual Personae by Camille Paglia, chapter by chapter for patrons. Only the first chapter is public. It is the last video I released. And if you want to sign up and join us on this journey, I'm live streaming after each chapter review, and we're having discussions about all the cool stuff she writes about, and we're having a great time so far. So if you want to join the party, you can click on the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food. Thank you very much, and I'll see you there. Today is The King in Yellow by the American author Robert W. Chambers, published originally in 1895. It's considered a classic in the genre of horror fiction, weird fiction, cosmic, spectral horror, Lovecraftian horror, all of those genres and subgenres. Longtime friend and patron Eric brought this to my attention recently. Thanks a bunch, man. Really appreciate it. He recently read one of the short stories in this collection called The Mask, which I believe is the second out of the four. And I was like, oh yeah, I totally forgot about that one. I gotta read it. And I, you know, I got a copy and it's short. So I was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's finally do this. Because I mean, you know, I started the show uh, uh, talking about, like, I mean, one of the very first reviews I did was of um, um, uh, Welbeck's love, book on Lovecraft, against the, world, against the World Against Life or something like that. And, which is a great book, amazing book. It was Michel Welbeck, you know, giving his thoughts on, uh, um, it was kind of an essayistic book all about H.P. Lovecraft and his, uh, his nihilism. And I had also seen True Detective around the time I started the show, and that was a huge thing for me. I mean, I thought that was a magnificent, one of, you know, one of the best, the best television series to this day that I've seen. Undoubtedly, it's better than Breaking Bad, in my opinion. But yeah, this book was a major inspiration to the show's writer, Nick Pizzolatto. Other influences included Ligotti and E.M. Sharon, In the Dust of This Planet by Eugene Thacker, and more. But yeah, I believe that's where I first heard about this book. The show references the Yellow King and the city Carcosa, so it takes elements from it. That's the most recent major work of art to utilize the mythos that you can trace back to Lovecraft, to Chambers, and to Ambrose Bierce. So it's kind of cool, right? The major theme underlying all the stuff in the Lovecraftian, cosmic, eldritch, horror, now we're getting super nerdy, uh, subgenre is the fear of the unknown, hallmark of Lovecraft's fiction. The King in Yellow is a seminal work of and a major influence on this subgenre. To know something is thus to control it, to make it knowable and therefore at least slightly safer. But what if what you sought to know was so vast and beyond reach that uh, any attempt drove you insane? That to know it, control it, is for humans finally impossible. And not only impossible, but um, severely inadvisable. So this is a very short book, so I'm not going to tell you too much about the plot and what happens in there, you know. I'm going to give you one reading of the the part that is my favorite part of the book. It's probably everybody's favorite part of the book. It's, it's going to pique your interest more than it is going to spoil the book. So it's going to be a little, a little vague in the storyline areas, which is preferable. So you actually read the book and you have some surprises. So this book is a collection of four different short stories, all connected thematically by the character's relationship to a fictitious play entitled The King in Yellow, reportedly a work of outstanding literary genius, but it has this peculiar effect of driving its readers insane. The four stories in here are The Repair of Reputations, The Mask, The Court of the Dragon, and The Yellow Sign. Personally, I think it's very difficult to beat The Repairer of Reputations, the first story in the book. It's the quintessential story and my favorite of the collection. So the first story takes place in an alternative American history. In New York in April hmm, of 1920, which is about a quarter of a century into the future after this was published. In 1920s New York, in a place, you know, in an America where they've basically um, completely done away with anybody who is not white. Everybody has been uh, forced out. It's this demented... Uh, landscape wherein the very first thing that's happening is uh, the inauguration, like the opening of uh, these lethal chambers, which are these assisted suicide clinics. So suicide is legalized and then these government lethal chambers are set up. And I couldn't help but think like, is this because of uh, people reading The King in Yellow, right? That's what I thought it was at first. 
And speaking of suicide, I mean, it's obviously a, a, a very serious and delicate subject, but it's a, it, you know, it's a very real issue right now in America, in the West in general. Between 21 and 22, almost 100,000 people killed themselves in the United States. And that's just um, actual suicide, intentional suicide. We're not talking about drug overdoses, you know, the slow suicide of alcoholism, stuff like that. You know, we're talking about just like straight up intentional suicide. Almost 100,000 people. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of bad stuff going on right now, and it's taken its toll on all of our mental health collectively. And we need tools for coping in a healthy manner with this. Some of my favorite methods are strength training, eating properly. Another method is therapy, which is why I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make finding therapy more affordable and accessible, which is helpful because finding a therapist could be potentially difficult given the slim options in your area, especially if you live somewhere a little more rural. Might be a little bit difficult to find a therapist. Definitely sounds nice these days, but uh, you know, might be, yeah, it might be a little bit difficult to find a therapist, especially one that you, uh, you get along with well. But this is why BetterHelp is helpful because you can go anywhere in the world and as long as you have access to an internet connection, you have access to your therapist. And they make finding a therapist easy because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions online, BetterHelp can match you with a therapist in as little as just a few days. And it's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link below in the description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash BTF. Clicking on that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. So you can check them out and see if it helps you. And I sincerely hope it does. And because finding the right therapist is a little bit like dating, if you don't initially fit with your therapist, which is a common thing in therapy, you can switch to a new therapist at any time with no additional cost, without having to worry about insurance or who's your network or anything like that. So if you're struggling right now, and let's be honest, who isn't? Please consider online therapy with BetterHelp. And thanks again to BetterHelp for supporting this channel. So it concerns a young man, a Poe-like, uh, unreliable narrator, who, after having a, a fall from his horse, went a little crazy in the head and was placed inside a mental hospital. And it was there that he discovered the infamous book, the one reported to drive people insane. There's a lecture on the book that I've linked to in the description below from the channel GSW English and Modern Languages. I wish they had the name of the lecturer. I cannot find him. But it was a fine lecture and I found it very helpful, so please check it out in the link below. So this is the uh, famous passage, also used by the lecturer. And you'll see why I'm reading the same one. It's just, it's just so good. So this is when he's in the madhouse, right? During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I just noticed right now, they never give, there's no author, right? They, ne they never mention who the author was, which is interesting. I remember after finishing the first act that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred grate and fell open on the hearth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page. And with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was of joy, so poignant that I suffered in every nerve, I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and reread it and wept and laughed and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, when the twin suns sink into the lake of holly, and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. I pray God will curse the writer, as the writer has cursed the world with this beautiful, stupendous creation, terrible in its simplicity, irresistible in its truth, a world which now trembles before the king in yellow. When the French government seized the translated copies which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread like an infectious disease, from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit, censored even by the most advanced of literary anarchists. No definite principles had been violated in those wicked pages, no doctrine promulgated, no convictions outraged. It cannot be judged by any known standard, yet, although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the King in Yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain, nor thrive on words in which the essence of purest poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow to fall afterward with more awful effect. So what an opening, right? I mean, that's page 10. Yeah, so I love that there's like no ideology behind this thing that is immediately identifiable to people to threaten their political power or religious power or influence. None of that. It's just like the work of art is so subversive in and of itself from some unknown author that it just completely destabilizes any and all systems. Uh, it's a wonderful premise. So it's quite a task Chambers has set up for himself, you know, to can, can the book, the collection of stories live up to this fictitious book, right? Can it, you know? So this man, Hildred, uh, becomes obsessed 
to the point where, upon his release, he becomes involved in an alleged coup in the United States and a pretense to royal ascension, with an ambitious goal of becoming basically like, you know, king of America, right? The only problem is uh, he's got to get rid of his cousin, who uh, is, is, in his mind, uh, holding him back from ascending to the throne, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, you, you never know. Not everything, at least. Some stuff is obvious, but... The King in Yellow is a weird fiction classic. Chambers was inspired by the American author Ambrose Bierce, horror story writer and uh, critic, uh, scathing critic, like notoriously scathing critic. They called him uh, Bitter Bierce. And uh, he wrote some very interesting, interesting short stories. Fascinating guy. He actually joined the, uh, the, the Mexican War uh, in, the, in his 70s and uh, went down there to the border and was never heard from again. And it's all kinds of things are speculated, but nobody has any idea what happened to him. It's a, it's a total mystery. And uh, there's a book I reviewed by an author named Carlos Fuentes called The Old Gringo. It's kind of an imagining of what, something akin to what may have happened to him down there. He's, he's one of the, the characters in the book, not the main character, but he's a very intense guy. And Chambers was also inspired, of course, by Edgar Allan Poe. And was, of course, famously an inspiration to the titan of cosmic horror and weird fiction himself, H.P. Lovecraft, who hailed The King in Yellow as one of the greatest weird tales ever written. So, for the uninitiated, for a horror writer, that's the equivalent of getting like a positive blurb from Satan himself, considering Lovecraft is arguably the greatest horror author ever. And I think there are many people who would share that opinion, including uh, Stephen King. And Chambers inspired him. So, The King in Yellow. This is an occult book, kinda. It's a book about a book of hidden knowledge and terrible power, right? In the vein of something like uh, The Call of Cthulhu by Lovecraft, again, uh, the Portrait of Dorian Gray, uh, or maybe more recently, um, House of Leaves or The Club du Mas by the great Spanish author Arturo Pérez Reverte. The notorious king of the collection resides in a fictional city, a fictitious city, which was taken from a story by Ambrose Bierce, published in 1896, called An Inhabitant in Carcosa, which I believe is kind of a post-apocalyptic or dystopian last man in a foreign, strange land story. Lovecraft later borrowed the imaginary city for his own purposes, as have those influenced by him who, you know, continue the Cthulhu mythos or whatever. So it's now in the fabric of the lore. This is what a lot of these horror authors do in this in this particular subgenre. They they borrow from uh, all the writers who came before them certain elements, and they they kind of continue this uh, lore. They they continue these myths, which are which are it's very cool in a way. It's ultra fucking nerdy in another way <laughs> but it's like you know it's it's also interesting you know that they uh it's it's almost a, a sign of respect well it must be a sign of respect you know i'm not really like a devotee of lovecraft or any of this this stuff uh i'm i'm pretty much like skimming the surface here i mean it it depends on how far <laughs> it depends on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go neo you know it's like there are people who are like really into this stuff it's fun to spend a little bit of time on Reddit and just uh, check out the threads on The King in Yellow. There's some very interesting theories, and from some pretty intelligent people, you know. Uh, so, it, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like comics or something, though. It, it gets to a level of, like, we're, we've graduated from, like, you know, horror fan to, like, mouth breather, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you gotta be careful. I mean, look at the symbol, right? Look at the symbol the illustration. I mean, it's like, it's got, you know, it's pagan, right? It's all occult pagan stuff it's to it's <laughs> it's totally in the alley i mean it's it's very uh found document curse ritualistic kind of thing wicker man it reminded me a lot of the book that ruins dorian gray and wilds the picture of dorian gray which turned out to be we's moms against nature one of the finest decadent novels of the era and one of my favorite books and one which chambers almost certainly read having studied art over in paris at the time that it was written and all these guys were hanging around you know uh, the decadent authors, that is. The decadent authors and poets and what have you in Paris. Chambers was actually over there studying art. Uh, his first published book, uh, which came before this one, uh, this is his second actually, was a book about artists and their lifestyle in the Latin Quarter, the district in Paris. Yeah, he studied art over there. He, Chambers himself was an illustrator. He actually did the uh, the original cover for The King in Yellow. The literary significance of the, the King in Yellow is fascinating to me because it is um, it appears to be one of the first syntheses of the Gothic novel, uh, which would be stuff like uh, The Castle of Otranto, uh, Frankenstein, um, Carmilla, uh, The Monk, 
and the decadent novel, which would be Against Nature, the poetry of Baudelaire, the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, Against Nature by J.K. Wiesemont, uh, Maldoror by Lautremont, Arthur Rimbaud, Marcel Schwab, Octave Mirbeau, guys like this. This is an evolution, a fusion of the two, to be carried on by Lovecraft, right? This is the history of horror literature, for which I should do a series, don't you think? I think that'd be cool. Let me know what you think in the comments, please. Maldoror is pretty early, but uh, I think that is considered a decadent work. According to a Reddit rumor, which actually seems pretty sound, Chambers was inspired by those old green books that were printed with arsenic that caused a lot of health problems back in the day. You can still see them in museums, I think. There is a sinister quality to it, kind of like, a, like Infinite Jest, like the tape in Infinite Jest. The play in, the, in this book has a sinister quality to it. What happens when a piece of art has that profound an impact on one's psyche? Is it possible? And wouldn't that simultaneously be the greatest and worst piece of art ever created? Uh, from the book's perspective, it seems to suggest yes. It's a strange book, this one. It almost feels like a hoax. Like Chambers is a fake author who never lived, and this was written by somebody else in far more recent times. I suspect I get that feeling because it feels strikingly modern. It's simple, straightforward, influenced by Poe, obviously, and Wilde too. Interestingly, I learned more architectural details from the vocabulary employed in the book, uh, maybe more than any other I've read. This is, I gather, because the brother of Robert W. Chambers was a well-known New York architect. The themes of The King in Yellow are the same as a lot of classic Gothic horror. Some kind of deep, incurable, psychological unease invading polite well-to-do society. Secrets are revealed. Hints of something shadowy, obscure, and dangerous, ancient, violent, perverse, uncontrollable. The darker part of nature, right? An ancient city, a previously unknown landscape, and an all-powerful figure that appears to drive people insane. The king in yellow wears a pale mask. There's a Borgesian quality to the book, right? I think of the, what is it, the one with the, the fellow in the mask traveling in the desert. The men are blind who have looked upon my face, that whole thing. I forget the name of the story. It's kind of out of time, cosmic, you know, unknowable, what have you. The law. There's this kind of religious, mythological, astrological profundity to the book. A lot of mysticism, pagan themes, elements, mystery. Readers are irreparably scarred by this piece of art. Except what's strange is that the book is actually supposed to be very beautiful. Like, it's actually a great play, in spite of the hideous consequences one suffers after reading it. And, and, you know, not everybody goes insane after reading it. There are some characters in the book who don't go insane. Uh, but stuff begins happening to them. I mean, they, they may be going insane. They may be in, like, the beginning stages or something. They're all connected, in a way, through this, uh, through this piece of art. This art has, this play has stained their psyches. It will never leave them, right? They're haunted by it. They're marked by it. They have the yellow sign or something, right? Like the mark of Cain, no? Cursed. Cursed by this seemingly inanimate object, which is actually like a, it's like the, uh, the opening of a process, right? It's like, it's like the experience of it is actually the initiation of a biological process that will eventually be your end. It will be your ruin, right? Your, your undoing. You are cursed. You're doomed. I love that. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great premise. You know, because, you know, so many questions immediately. How does it work? Where do I get a copy? <laughs> of course, here now, you know, everybody pirate the PDF and we all be done for in two weeks. Send it out on Instagram and everywhere. Just be... <laughs> There's just the slightest Kafkaesque layer to the work. It's kind of an absurd comedy, really. And even this guy in the lecture below calls it a satire. And uh, you can see that in some stuff. And, and I think really what, what drove that home most was uh, the line where... <clears throat> In the beginning, you know, this guy, he's, he's going to ascend to the, the level of, like, you know, Emperor of the United States or whatever, or King of the United States. And uh, the only person getting in his way is his, um, his cousin. And uh, <laughs> his cousin is not insane, and he brings his cousin over. And his cousin is, like, walking around his place, and he's uh, looking at the books he's reading. And he's, <laughs> and he's saying something like, Napoleon, 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 uh, nothing but Napoleon. <laughs> It's like for you young folks, like the equivalent to this is like walking over to some of these places and seeing like nothing, nothing but the works on their shelves of uh, Adolf Hitler, right? Just like, you know, somebody who's preparing for like world domination or whatever. The book operates great as a metaphor for disease, uh, like what we just saw over the last uh, few years, or as a, uh, as a metaphor for um, ideology, which spreads much in the same way. I'm not sure of the history of the narrative tradition of works of art that kill the viewer. 
But you can certainly see it in books like, you know, um, Infinite Jest and uh, uh, films like The Ring or Ring You, you know, stuff like that. Terrifying films, those ones. And certainly in the book there's, yeah, there's the element of French decadence. Uh, Robert W. Chambers studied art in Paris in the, uh, you know, the fin de siècle era. So it would be very surprising if he hadn't read, you know, Wiesmont and uh, Mirbeau or uh, Schwab or Baudelaire, Rimbaud, um, Oscar Wilde and so on. There's actually a character named Wilde in it who is having a very difficult time with a cat in his apartment. Not, uh, not unlike uh, uh, Uncle Monty in uh, <laughs> With Nell and I. You beastly little parasite, how dare you! Except the cat has the upper hand most certainly in this book. So yeah, the second one, The Mask, is a tale of unrequited love about a man who discovers the alchemical secret to instantly turning living creatures or things, objects, into um, stone, marble-like stone. This was the most shocking of the book because it had uh, a happy ending, amazingly. Reminded me of a film by a, a Spanish horror film director uh, named uh, Nacho Terda, who made a, a short film called Genesis, which is uh, about... A sculptor who loses his wife, like the love of his life, and he starts sculpting her, and uh, he makes this beautiful sculpture of her, kind of in a you know Venus style, and then suddenly the sculpture starts bleeding, right, and he realizes that uh, it's coming to life, and as she comes to life, the sculpture comes to life, uh, he begins turning to stone, and it's beautiful, beautiful short film. Um, I don't think there's any dialogue in it at all. Uh, great short film. Um, so that's what the, the story immediately reminded me of. And that's probably the most like Wildian one in the book. It definitely has these kind of uh, upper crust characters and their emotional drama, right? The Court of the Dragon is about a man being chased by a stranger. I think he spots him in a uh, church uh, while, uh, while an organ is being played. And he spots this guy moving around in a way that seems impossible. Like seeing him in one area and then seeing him in another and realizing it's not possible for him to get from one place to the other so quickly. And this man keeps throwing him a glares of hatred. The Court of the Dragon is about a man being chased by a stranger, as is the Yellow Sign. Which is about a painter being terrorized by a kind of nightmarishly living dead man. This painter is in love with his model and uh, she's having dreams about this man who's chasing the painter. Again, threaded through the narratives are references to the book The King in Yellow, and there are even excerpts of this fictitious book. Chambers has created excerpts that he inserts here and there uh, from this mysterious play, which is all the more entertaining, of course, because it makes it feel like it's a real work. There's this weird element of cosmic nihilism present within The King in Yellow. There's something misanthropic, Schopenhauerian, or uh, antinatalist about it. A warning of the cosmic horror of the universe, or the things beyond mankind, you know? Uh, things just below the surface that will drive men out of their minds. Things more powerful than them that they cannot control. These are like the themes of the book. One Reddit user discussed a rumor that the book itself was uh, the deceased body of God. Thus the play uh, is, a, is a manifestation of the proof of God's death and drives the reader insane. Or the person on Reddit who posted about that was referencing somebody else's theory. It's this kind of quest for dark empowerment that obliterates established order and reintroduces nightmarish chaos upon that which has been deemed unworthy. It's a megalomaniacal cosmic horror fantasy. The whole book has the atmosphere of burgeoning supreme power that would normally drive most men to insanity or death. The end of days, revelations, judgment day, the singularity. Hell, when you think of it in those terms, isn't that something fascinating? Imagine the developer who writes the program that shall undo mankind. The King in Yellow is psychological illness as literature. And I'm certainly not the only one to make that disease analogy. It's not a violent experience of sheer terror, like a book version of having the flu or being hungover or contracting dysentery. I mean, you'll be far more physically um, repulsed uh, by reading Sod, you know? No, it's more like a lifelong, strange, painful flare-up of cosmic depression. Not even that particularly impressive upon initial arrival, but it grows malignant over time, taking on new qualities with each sour, dreaded visit like an existential migraine, or like a particularly maladjusted relative. Not quite insane, but just not quite. The King in Yellow is a book, I mean, predominantly about the, the sinister truth of human curiosity. The only thing worse than knowing what lurks beneath the book's cover is perhaps not knowing. Whether the megalomaniac madness came first or second is really chicken or the egg. For all the stories in the book, it's as if, for these characters, the life and color had been leached out of reality and been transfused to an alternate one ruled by the King in Yellow. 
And for those aware of its power, cursed by this knowledge, the only thing that beats with blood is a vision of this place, Carcosa, or wherever, previously inaccessible or unknown to mankind. For the better, one can certainly argue. It's like visions of Babylon or, or a Sodom and Gomorrah suddenly like infecting people in the modern day and like realizing that there is in fact a place that still exists somewhere, somewhere either on or, or outside of Earth, under the Earth, above the Earth, wherever. And uh, it's possible to get there, but uh, one has to be kind of mad to, to take the journey. Or like, you know, any of the Lovecraft mythos. Yeah, Lovecraft had his own city through, I think it was called Rylea or something like that, but a hellish place, like the true location of evil or something. But for the initiates, it is now the only thing that lives. It is the only thing that has any life. It obsesses them and it will not stop haunting them. It seems to obsess them to various degrees. Play and the location. It's pretty ambiguous. It's pretty vague. There's also a strange short film from years back uh, by John Carpenter, you know, director of Halloween and The Thing and many more. Yeah, it had a Norman Reedus and Udo Kier. It was about an eccentric uh, film aficionado, uh, an aristocrat, who was in search of the print, uh, the, the sole print, the single print of a notorious film uh, that caused a murderous riot upon its release in the 70s and then was never seen again. Definitely worth watching if you're a horror film buff. Found documents or footage of a really dark variety are these malignant or chaotic elements of nature, like a virus. Or something. The evil of the universe manifested. Art as a virus, as an illness. Isn't it the apex of artistic achievement to have such a profound impact on the consumer? Manifesting itself physically, right? And what about the Bible or other religious texts that have done so much good? Isn't it therefore possible to have a text that can inspire that much bad? If a work of art can make you cry, then in time, uh, I'm almost certain, you know, it can drive you insane. And this lecture below solidified this thought. He brought this up too. Art as disease, or you know, the the, the yellow king as uh, this this sickness, the psychological sickness, or literal sickness. He brings up the alchemist sculptor whose conception transforms the living flesh to the cold, unfeeling stone, and the painter who unconsciously begins painting with a color palette of the diseased, the yellows of decay. The sun is yellow, and the sun is a dying star. The place of this king, Carcosa, doesn't give off the impression of death but rather of a hideous, festering, exuberant life, a nocturnal life. Maybe that's just me. But these locations mentioned in the book, these places of epic beauty, I don't know, it just kind of sounds like Switzerland. The fascinating thing in the book is that even its detractors, the play's detractors in the book, claim that it's an artistic masterpiece, like it's indisputable. It's just universally agreed in the book, like this thing is amazing, but it's gonna destroy us all. We might do well to heed that warning, given what we're uh, looking at right now with OpenAI and anyways, Mark my words. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I enjoyed uh, uh, reading it and I enjoyed researching all the stuff around, behind it, stuff that came from it, so on. But I gotta say, while I wanted the book to be a deep, disturbing, nihilistic, romping precursor to Lovecraftian misanthropy, it's true that the stories in here are also filled with um, underdeveloped, sappy, romantic melodrama and on the one hand are disappointingly thin, light, and floofy. Not challenging literature in the slightest. Poe is on a vastly more intellectual level. Not terrible, uh, still enjoyable. Not poorly written, just a little clunky. Yet simultaneously there's sort of an awkward, ill at ease feeling I get when contemplating it, uh, the whole project in general. There's something about that first story that lends itself to a kind of mythology. And the ending one is disturbing too. There is a tone that the book possesses that is in its own way at first seemingly innocuous, but actually genuinely disturbing and creepy, even after all these years. Like 1895, right? Over a hundred years ago. That last story really lands the right ending note too. The King in Yellow is a true occult book in that its final meaning is forever hidden, right? The, the, the meaning behind the fictional book and generates discussion after discussion, forever. That's, that's the fun of it. That because it's this, if you appreciate myth and mystery and lore, you know, and legend and uh, uh, rumor and, uh, you know, conspiracy, right? Uh, it's a, the, first, the first story in this book is, is a conspiracy against the United States. It's an endless rabbit hole of nihilistic, philosophical, mythological, astrological, 
theological, what have you. It begins moving into nonsense or madness, but it's kind of fun to explore the various theories about what it is, right? For that reason, and many more, including its inarguable historical literary significance, it's better than food. Check it out. So you should read it. Well, yeah, if you're a fan of Lovecraft, Algernon Blackwood, Arthur Machen, Thomas Ligotti, Schopenhauer, True Detective Season 1, and maybe if you enjoy The 20 Days of Turin by uh, Giorgio de Maria, get a hold of this one right away. Oscar Wilde's A Picture of Dorian Gray, of course. The Decadent Poets, uh, the Gothic novels. Yeah, pick this one up. All right. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching the show. I take the names of all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this jar, and for every review, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. Currently from Nicaragua. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, you can click on the link below, or go to patreon.com forward slash books better than food, and you can donate what you can afford. And you can always put a monthly cap on it to fit your budget. You'll also get access to the patron-only series going on. Currently, I am doing a chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of Camille Paglia's sexual persona. A little bright in here. Yeah. And uh, that has been going great. You also get access to the patron-only reviews, the supplementary live streams that I do, the Discord channel, all these reviews ad-free, and the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, films, music. Changes every week. If you think we have similar tastes, I think you'll really enjoy that. Cool. Also, international shipping is included. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, all my patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Logan. Just Logan. Thank you very much, Logan. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers, plus some delicious coffee, roasted by yours truly. And I hope you love both as much as I, and that you don't go insane. Cheers. Please subscribe if you have not already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, die reading. All right. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.